Thank you all for joining today to learn about how to maintain the Cocotone 65 melanger. We call it ECGC 65. Right now, the model is E, you know, uh, so 65E. If you do the proper maintenance, it can work for more than a decade. We have some customers who have been using this machine since, since 2006. But a lot of people, uh, you know, they were wondering how to maintain it. So with that, we will have this virtual webinar to show you how to maintain it. So it gives you the trouble-free operation. So thank you all. And first, you know, before going into the webinar, I just want to give you a small background about Cocota because uh, we have not done a good uh, job of, uh, you know, marketing our brand to a lot of people. And uh, also we see some of uh, the people who are joining, they are not our customers yet, but maybe our potential customers. So we welcome you all. So it's just a two minutes. I'm not going to take a lot of your time. Cocotown was formed, uh, the parent company was called Inno Concepts. And we formed the Inno Concepts in 1992. And we wanted to start trading uh, innovative specialty food processing machines. We primarily focused on the machines for the South Indian cooking. And over the years, when people buy, if we don't recognize the South Indian name, we used to call and find out what they are using those machines for. And then the business was growing and <clears throat> we had uh, distributors around USA and who were uh, selling and also giving service for the units locally so people don't have to ship it to us and then you know uh, suddenly in 2007 2008 the recession hit and then we wanted to pivot because we wanted to stay uh, in the business but we realized just focusing on one simple you know single demographics is not going to be a sustainable business and then we looked at our notes on seeing what all the people were using these machines for. Then we realized some of them were using it for cocoa, you know, grinding cocoa beans into chocolate. We said, okay, that sounds like an interesting one because at that time, there were only like four or five people were making chocolate in small scale. It's supposed to be a small scale when compared to the big giants. But even then, they had to spend millions of dollars to bring refurbished units from Europe and then they had to repair it and then still they had to uh, grind a ton of, uh, you know, uh, cocoa uh, beans to make chocolate. So we said, okay, we will make sure that we can uh, empower everyone and make the playing field level for everyone. So we started with a three-pronged approach to the sustainability. We wanted to make sure environmental sustainability. So we use only high quality stainless steel as much as possible on our machines. So they last longer and also they're recyclable. And also the business sustainability. We wanted to make sure our customers' business sustainability is a main um, reason we are in business. So we wanted to make sure we give them the education, equipment, everything that's needed for uh, <clears throat> doing the business. Then agricultural sustainability. We found out when we were traveling, most of the farmers around the world, they were 50 plus years. The younger generation didn't want to go into farming. And I don't blame them because they didn't see any money. They cannot stay in the village and work hard all day and then struggling for just eating three meals or square meals a day. So they were going to the cities and then uh, to earn money. But that's not sustainable because we can earn money in the city by working. But at the end of the day, when we eat, we need the farmers to produce food for us. We have a saying, if the farmer doesn't put his foot in the mud, we don't have the food on our table. So we wanted to make sure the farmers get benefit. So the, ch the chocolate business seemed to be good because our customers started paying more for the farmers than the commodity prices. And also the farmers themselves can make intermediary products instead of selling the beans at commodity prices, they can sell as nibs or chocolate. So uh, the other objectives we had was to help the farmers produce flavor beans and also to make the uh, cocoa as a superfood <clears throat> and then uh, help chocolate makers make chocolate with the healthy food instead of a junk food. 
and then this is a small timeline that we were over the years so in 1994 we started the introducing the uh, first wet grinder in 2007 we had the commercial uh, grinder for uh, chocolate and then 2010 we had the roaster then we had the patterns and then in 2020 we had again pivot because the pandemic came all over the world and we had to struggle um, at least we were fortunate to be in usa we got some government assistance but we realized you know our customers in a lot of the uh, countries they didn't get any help and they had to stay you know uh, in business so we thought it's a good uh, time to focus more on the education so we started bringing the empowering chocopra news webinar series so we do twice a month and the, the one advantage of the pandemic is people got, uh, you know, very comfortable with the technology now with the Zoom. And we can talk to people in like 40 different countries from one place and everybody can see and learn at their own pace. So thank you all. That's the um, thing. And then now we are, you know, with the vaccine and everything, we are hoping that the world will come back to the normal sea we can still we miss seeing people face to face so we are waiting to start traveling and meeting you all in your countries and then but still we will also continue the virtual connections like i said because this one we can reach more people and uh, we without uh, you know and also for the people who are joining is cheaper because from their comfort of their room or the office they can learn and we always want to you know end with this loka samasta sukhino bhavantu may all beings everywhere in the universe be happy and free and may the thoughts words and actions of my own life contribute in some way to that happiness and uh, to all thank you now teresa will take over and she will give some housekeeping Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Welcome to Coco Town Empowering Chocolatepreneurs webinar series. This is uh, one in our equipment basics uh, series. And uh, so what we'll ask for you to do is to put your questions in the chat. Uh, if you look at the bottom of the Zoom screen, you'll have a chat button and you can put your questions in the chat and we'll do our best to get to your questions uh, as we're going. If we miss your question, don't worry, because we will have um, a transcript of those questions sent out at a later date with all the answers. And so put your questions in the chat for us. Also, we are recording this webinar and you will receive a link to view the recording at a later date. So don't worry if you miss something uh, or taking notes, we will be sending you the recording of the webinar. All right, so with that, we will go ahead and turn over the event to Dr. Balu and the Coco Town team to tell us how to keep that ECGC 65 grinder running forever. Welcome to the Coco Town webinar. Uh, this week, I'm going, we, are, we are planning to have a series of webinars uh, addressing the maintenance and uh, simple repairs of our machines. Most of our machines, they just last for a long time. Um, this is like, uh, I mean, in the U.S., they have a uh, Metag uh, commercial. I mean, oh, they really the repairmen sitting down and waiting for the call like that. And if you don't have that many repairs, people really, as long as they do a simple maintenance, it just runs forever. Uh, so, uh, we know, the, the, there's a lot of people that uh, they buy some of our used machines and then they we still provide them the service. So, we provide the service uh, no matter when you buy, where you buy. We provide you the service. Uh, this webinar, we are going to focus on the routine maintenance needed. I have given, these are the, made the, the six items that we are going to be talking about. And think that it's in the order of importance. Uh, based on our customer usage and also the way it works, the number one factor we have recognized in giving the best performance of the grinder is adjusting the tension on the stone. That one that has a big impact on how fast, let me go to the next slide. Adjusting the tension on the stone. So number one factor, adjusting grinding performance. The consistency in performance. The first time we recognized the need was I mean, the very early in the business when we sold several machines to um, uh, the company called uh, uh, 
chocolate uh, in, in, in UK. I don't know what's in that company name in UK. Our customer, first customer, they bought a lot of machines. No. So the, they bought about five or six machines and uh, they had a uh, hotel chocolate. Uh, they have bought about five or six machines and then they were trying to uh, kind of a franchise. They have a several branches. So they want to keep one machine in each branch and then they have an R&D department. They want to develop the recipe. And uh, the, they found out that the recipe doesn't apply to all the four machines exactly the same. There was some difference in the way, um, the, the, the difference in the way the, 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 the machine was performing. So they called us, I have to fly to London to help them, help them out. We found out that uh, the machine performance, I mean, the, as far as the machine performance concerned, exactly the same, except the one factor that was not consistent was the tension on the stone. So once we figured a way to make sure that all the five machines that had that had the same tension on the uh, on the stone, bingo. I mean, ever I mean that they were getting the same performance in all the five machines. That's when we realized that uh, the number one factor is the, the, the tension. I mean, people were initially thinking maybe we have to resurface the wheels. Is the wheels are smooth and all that? Yeah, that make a difference. But the major impact is uh, the number one of the tension. So. Uh, I'm going to quickly show you a couple of videos and then I'm going to go on live and then show you that. Uh, let's, let's quickly. So what, what we are showing is, I mean, then, then we installed a, um, a tension gauge. So one can monitor, measure and monitor the pressure on the stone. So what you do is uh, initially you look at uh, the, make sure that, uh, uh, the, the swing arm is touching the, uh, what you call this a tension knob. So, uh, so in the beginning, when you don't have any pressure applied, you are doing almost close to zero. Then when you start turning, you see that the pressure slowly increases. And then we designed it in such a way that by turning 10 turns, you should go to the pressure of 100 PSI. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, I mean, then uh, during the run, I mean, uh, you can constantly monitor uh, the, what the tension on the stone. So, with this simple the, 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 uh, the, the gauge, you can monitor the pressure on the stone. Uh, I'm going to switch to, let me see what the next video we have on this. Um, we also have a, a digital uh, pressure tension, tension gauge, I mean, uh, you can use for more accurate reading. Uh, and not only that, I mean, uh, that has a capability to connect to your Bluetooth, so you can monitor the... the, the. I'll show you in the video, I mean, when I go on a video, uh, I'm going to switch to video now. So this, this is a digital digital uh, pressure transducer. You can replace the mechanical one with the digital one. It's made by a company called Elitech. Uh, it has a Bluetooth capability. You can monitor the pressure from your phone. Okay. Now, let's go back and look at uh, this simple thing. To The first thing you measure is, um, before you go and adjust anything, get a, get a, get a, so we have to, we have a simple way of measuring. Uh, if, let's say, uh, let's assume that uh, you don't have enough pressure reading on that one. The first thing that is the reason for that could be either the stones are worn out or uh, uh, mostly the delta in wearing out, that is the main cause for that to happen. So what do you do? You put a, you put a level on the top and then measure the gap Move the camera first. We need to move. move the, can they can they see it? So you measure the distance between the top of the roller holder to the bottom of the scale. So this is the the scale they're resting on the two uh, uh, what you call chassis arms uh, support, and then you measure the distance. It should be approximately about 50 mm. In that range, you know, I mean, if it is the delta is worn out, 
then you see that that's going down. There are a couple of things we can put, we, things we can do. One is you change the delta and insert, bring back where it should be, or we can lift the drum slightly up. That's it. That's how we may adjust the tension. And then the other thing is the spring. The spring is designed to last for a long time. I mean, a really very rarely we sell the things, but as routine maintenance, we tell them it's very simple, that they're, they're really cheap. It's a really, really simple thing to change the spring. Uh, you can change the spring maybe once in two years just to bring the tension back. Uh, these are the maintenance, the simple things you do for maintaining the tension on the stone. I'm going to quickly show you a video. Of Somebody is asking, you know, um, the tension is it has to be constant to throw the grinding process or maybe at this point. Uh, the it's an interesting question because the grinding, then I mean in, in the, the conch, people call this a conch, but people call it a grinder because it does both. It, it grinds and also it conches. During the grinding process, initially, when you are adding the uh, nibs, it's recommended that you keep the tension low. All you are trying to do is crush the nibs so that the the uh, uh, the cocoa butter comes out. Then you can become a paste. For that process, you don't need too much pressure. So all you need is a just kind of continuous crushing for some time. You can keep it maybe about 40 to 60 for initial stages when you add the cocoa nibs. Once you finish adding the cocoa nibs, when you start grinding, when it becomes everything is a liquid, then you start adding the, uh, I mean, then you start increasing the pressure. You go approximately about 80. You don't have to really go to 100. If you go to 80, uh, Giving an extra pressure really does not give you any additional benefit. The increment, the benefit may be really incremental. So I would suggest do not over pressure because it's not, it, would, it, would, it only causes the premature wear of the deldrin uh, rather than giving you additional performance. So I would suggest you, uh, you keep it about 80 pounds and then uh, you, uh, I mean, 80 pounds you should be able to get in about 78 turns. So when the deltan wears out, you still have a two, three turns to compensate for the thing. You can bring it always back to 80 to 100. It's not a problem. Uh, for, the, when, for, any, for like any other equi any, any equipment, we always have to calibrate, make sure that the reading or you see here is exactly the correct reading. So this is a kind of a design with a piston and a, a, a dial gauge. It's a combination of this. During that course, I mean, uh, this can change. So what you do once in maybe three months or so, you measure, ma manually measure the pressure on the stone by pressing it down. So if I press it down, let's say 80 pounds, you should see 80 pounds. How do I make sure I press 80 pounds? That's a simple thing. So you can take a, any business card and put the business card underneath the, um, I mean, underneath the uh, tension knob, okay? Now, Make sure that I, mean, I cannot pull it. I'm right right now. I am reading. Let's say I'll put it down. Sixty psi. Okay. I'm going to make sure that the sixty psi is correct. So you just buy a luggage scale. It's about maybe fifteen twenty dollars. Okay. So you put that luggage gay luggage. I mean, buy something that has the uh, the, the cloth tape. At, I mean, on on the set. And then set that dial to zero. And then you try to pull it. On one hand, hold your again scale. The other hand, hold your uh, business card and pull, slightly pull the business card, give a slight pressure and bring, I mean, bring the swing arm, pull the swing arm down using the dial gauge. At one point, you will see that that the pressure will come out. So now I have measured what kind of a pull I need or push I need to bring uh, to 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 bring the business card out. I saw about to, close to twenty eight pounds. So the multiplication factor is you divide that by uh, multiply by two. If you see twenty eight here, it should be fifty six here. So that's why, because I mean, this is the center that you are measuring at the end. So you are now calibrating that. I'm reading here about 28. I'm reading here about 60, 28. Um, so we are pretty sick. We are about four, plus or minus two pounds. That's that. So we can 
once in maybe three months or six months, you just calibrate, or you can do it every batch. I mean, if you want, it's a really simple thing to do. I mean, like I said, you know how long it took for me to, you know, put the business card here, dial gauge, bring it to zero. Consistently, I'm reading at 28, 29. So that's all it takes. I mean, even if you want to do for every batch, it's not a bad idea. And even if you have a digital one, I would recommend that to have a two measurements. This is more accurate. I mean, assuming that, I mean, the, uh, the uh, uh, luggage scale is uh, accurate. So the two, two devices reading the same tells you that, I mean, you are pretty much in good control over the reading. So when the, the, the next thing is what happens, uh, you know, you have taken care of the, uh, uh, the stones. I mean, still you are not able to bring the 80 to 100 PSI. We recommend you, because there's a continuous wear and tear that may happen about four, after four or five years of use. Uh, we have to slightly, because uh, the stone wears out maybe a millimeter or two, both the bottom stone and also the grinding stone. At that point, we may have to raise the drum. I just quickly will show you how you raise the drum. Uh, there's a video that can do that. Uh, I will play the video quickly and then uh, we will uh, also show you physically how you do that. Okay. I'm going to stop the video, share the screen. Um, so now we have a couple of disks. I mean, I mean, you use a disk. I'm going to show you the disk. I mean, physically in a minute. So you select the. You decide. I mean, you remember. I mean, I told you. So you, you you take the bolt out at the bottom of the drum. Point. I mean, we do have this videos. I mean, I will share with you if anyone is interested. So you lift the drum. Two people will lift the drum. So you put the washer, I mean, I'm going to show you the washer. So you, you put the washer on the, we may not have time to do that physically here. That's why I'm showing you the video, but uh, I'll show you the steps you need. Then you put the drum back. Okay, now let me go back and go to live video. Um, I think you can see the video, right? What, what I want to show you is the disks I was talking about. Okay? These are the disks. If any question, I can tell you there are different thickness. So we have to lift, we have to lift the drum by a certain distance, by, by a certain uh, uh, distance. How do I know how many disks I have to use, what size disk we have to add? Easiest would be, like I said, go back, go back, and measure distance from here to here. It should be up to approximately 50 millimeters. Now you measure the distance, maybe using a caliper. Using a caliper, you measure the distance and see what it is. Right now, I'm reading about 40, no, 46, I think, about 46 or something like that. So if it's one out, you will see that number higher than 50. You know, it's a brand new unit, so it's, there's no wear and tear. So you will see a number maybe about 55 or 50, something like that. So you must take the difference. It should be it should be 50. Now you are reading, let's say 55, and I mean now you don't need that. You won't wear out that much. Maybe you are you are reading 50, 50, 53. Then you have to add three millimeter disc into that bottom. So depending upon how much you have to raise to bring it back to 50, you add that number of washers at the bottom. As shown in the video. That's how you lift the drum to do that. So 
as far as tension, uh, measuring the tension, how you bring the tension back, we talked about that. If you don't have any question, we can go to the next topic. The next slide is um, Delrin inserts and stones. Okay. Uh, okay. So the next thing is, I mean, know the uh, the when I'm going to show you the the stones and Delrin inserts and all that. Okay, uh, I'm going to bring the Delvin stones. These are some used stones from a customer. Uh, typically, I mean, I mean, also I can show you a brand new stone. I'm not sure. I'm going to show you a new stone. A new stone, people who bought this machine a long time ago, they will have a this design stones. They will have a this design stones uh, with a smaller delrin uh, with no collar on the outside. So if you have this kind of a stone, uh, we can still replace this delrin, but maybe at that point is really old. I mean, we would recommend you to buy a new set of stones. The reason we moved from this to this, this the, the the reason is right now in this one probably you can see about maybe uh, seven millimeters of thick delrin. So once you wear out, then you will start wearing out the shaft, so which is not good. I mean, you'll be damaging the, the shaft. So we made in this machine, we made it thicker than this, and then we put a collar outside to to eliminate uh, additional washer that we add in this case. So this is a old, old kind, of old style stone. This is a new style stone, and then I'll show you how this delrin insert look when it's outside. Okay. Uh, these are new set of stones. Uh, th this, these are the uh, used set of stones. I want to show you. You can even see chip. You can see customer damage. Here we have a set of stones we got back from the customer. Customer wanted us to replace the Delrin stones, and we are in the process of doing it. What do you do? I mean, no, we have again a video for doing that systematically. I mean, no, it's uh, the video bandwidth is not enough. Um, uh, so you, you, these are the new set of Delrin stones, and this is the set of Delrin stones that we took it out, and you can see that, uh, the number, I'll go through the, number, the different steps. First thing you do is you remove the existing Delrin. So use a hydraulic press or hammer to push that thing, Delrin out, take the chip, break the Delrin and push it through, it'll come out. And then you have, a. um, um, uh, we will supply you the Delrin insert. When we supply the Delrin insert, these are new set of Delrin insert. If you buy it from us, it will be slightly bigger than the actual hole. It won't go in by itself. We purposely make it slightly higher because there is a variation from stone to stone, the uh, diameter of the uh, hole. And also when you clean it, sometimes people over clean it. So when that happens, they, the, the Delrin will be loose. So the Delrin when you put a new set of Delrin insert, when you install them in the stone, it has to be exactly the snug fit. You cannot lose it. Say for example, I have two of them. Okay, one is the snug fit. So that is the right size. If you look at this one, it goes in easily like that. So this is loose. So we don't want to have a loose one. So it should be a snug fit. How do you get a snug fit? So you take this and put it in a lathe or some kind of a drill press and then make it, uh, the, the thin it down with the sandpaper to bring it to the right diameter. That's step number one. Step number two, you have to make sure that when you insert the Delrin, it comes in two halves. So when you put the two halves together, it has to be, it has to connect exactly with the no hole in the center. If it is, if it is too long, then you are going to have the Delrin, when you insert it, um, it will be sticking out and then you will have a gap here. You don't want that gap. So it has to be plush against that. So if you want to make sure it's plush against that, you have to make sure that the two Delrin together, when they put them together, it should match exactly the same. Uh, let's say the Delrin is shorter than what it should be. Then you will see a gap here. 
So you don't want that gap in the middle. So it has to be just perfectly the right size. So for that purpose, what you do is you take the caliper and you measure the thickness of the stone. Okay. The thickness of the stone I see here is a 109.53 millimeter. Okay. Just make sure that you take that 109.53. 9.5. Okay. And then you take the new drill and inserts, what you got from us. Okay. So you, you did the step number one, you reduce the diameter. The step number two, you measure the gap between these two. You see that you measure the distance between these two. It should be exactly what, the same size. If it is too big, I mean, we generally supply slightly longer than it is. So you should be reading higher than 109.5. All you need to do is take a sandpaper and sand it on one end and then sand it enough to bring it back where it reaches 109.5. So then you know that you have prepared this correct. So after this, you know, you get the epoxy glue and then using an epoxy glue, you know, apply a really, really thin layer. You don't really need much glue. The, the technically speaking glue, you should not be even needing a glue. Glue is only to just keep that in place. Because if it's a snug fit, the friction between the delrin and stone, that itself is enough to hold it, especially when you press it down with the drill press. I mean, not drill press, I mean the hydraulic press, that should be enough. The, so you, you maybe the amount of you need, the glue you need should be significantly less than a gram. So you don't need much. Make sure that you press it all the way down and there's no any gap. So you are done. So that's how you adjust, change the delrin to make sure the wear out for the, to, to compensate for the wear out of the delrin inserts. Uh, any questions on the delrin inserts? Yeah. You can repeat the question also so the other people hmm. can listen. They're asking what kind of epoxy and how do you remove the, uh, the existing delrin uh, from the old stone? Uh, I mean, I mean, for those of Repeat you, I mean, the in the in the video we have it. Basically, it's, it's not really that difficult. If I if I have it, in that just. As you can see, thickness of the delrin. So really, the uh, you won't damage the uh, tenor steel shaft with the just thick delrin. I mean, you will you will see the difference in the, 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 you know the change in performance even before you start damaging the shaft. So that's why in the uh, several years ago, we moved away from the smaller delrin insert from the thicker delrin insert. Okay. We use uh, the araldite, del araldite epoxy glue, uh, but today we have tested this for uh, animals. I mean, it's, 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 uh, as long as you don't expose the glue outside, you are okay. In this case, all you are doing is mixing the glue and then uh, applying it inside so that, I mean, you know, the, the holes inside the chocolate never comes into contact with the glue. And also any excess glue, you use a sandpaper after you glue it, use a sandpaper, uh, remove all the excess glue. So you will not have any glue exposed to the food. Okay. So the, you, you take a chisel, something like that, and then put the chisel and you hammer it. You will take this part of the uh, delrin out. So then at that point, you will have a delrin. Do you have any stone that has a delrin partly broken? No. Okay. So you, 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 that then all you need to do is, uh, so you will see, I don't know if we have any delrin I can show you with uh, the ring removed. So the top ring is going to be chiseled out at that point, and then you, you hammer it. You find a wood or metal piece about about this much diameter. What diameter is it? About 48, 40, 40, milli, 40 millimeter diameter uh, metal metal bar. Uh, you hammer it, hammer it down. It'll come down. Uh, we we have a hydraulic press. And we use a hydraulic press to press it down. Uh, in the picture, in the video also that we have, they use a hydraulic press to press it down. That's how you take it out. Uh, what's the next one? Next one, we'll talk. 
Okay. Next, we are going to talk about the oil change. Before we go into the oil change, I want people to understand the, the gearbox, uh, the, the construction of the gearbox, why it's done certain way and all that. Um, um, if, if you look at that, in the whole grinder, most of the stress is by pressing the bone it's stored down. It's a heavy drum and the stones are, I mean, all the stones are heavy, and on the top of it, you are pressing it down. What happens to all the pressure goes into the gearbox, and the, the pressure, the, 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 the pressure on the, pressure on the, uh, the whole pressure is stopped at the bottom of the gearbox. So what we call as an axial force, axial tension. That axial tension has to be stopped at the, the bottom of the gearbox. So that is a major difference in the, the, the gearbox that we use, it's a time tested. People have been using it for years. And uh, we have hundreds of missions we have sold. If you look at the number of gearboxes we sold, but maybe there will be relative less than 10. Very few gearboxes we have sold. There too, and people, and there are customers that we have talked to, that they, they have never changed the oil in their, in their gearbox. And I call them after 10 years of use, they say, okay, by the way, uh, why are maintenance, you don't have to do it often. <clears throat> Even changing oil, in the beginning, we, <clears throat> we were using a regular gear oil, and once we see, change to a synthetic gear oil, it'll go for two, three years very easily. So oil change itself is only maybe about less than 30 minutes maintenance. Really, there's no reason to do, there's no reason to do anything. So, uh, I mean, I mean, there's no reason not to doing the oil change once in two, three years. I mean, I mean, even after three years of use, when people drain the oil, change when they are changing the oil, you will see that the oil is really clean. You don't see much, the, you know, wear out you can see inside. So I'm going to show you the uh, gearbox just to give you an idea how the gearbox construction is. It's a cast iron gear, gear, gearbox. It's very well made. I mean, with very well, you know. There's not much heat generated. Even the heat generated is dissipated effectively. There's so the gearbox doesn't really get hot at all. So what you do, just to give you an idea. So you have a you have a shaft in the front, which is connected to the motor. Okay. So when you, when the motor turns, this shaft turns, and then that turns the vertical shaft. So the way it designed is all the actual force you give on top of the gearbox is rested at the bottom, I mean, stops at the bottom, doesn't get into the belt or it doesn't get into the motor. So this stops the tension at this point. So you just imagine you are running day in and day out for, for seven days a week, I mean, 24 hours a day, uh, for several years, the gearbox can take all the load all the time, all the time uh, because this, what you call that as a, what we call that as a taper roller bearing uh, that's designed for taking the uh, load. Uh, most of the gearboxes that you see, the aluminum gearboxes that people use uh, with the motor attached, what you call beltless gearboxes in the grinders, uh, I'm not sure they have the, uh, the, the tapered roller bearings to really take the uh, stress of the uh, system. So the, it, it, let me see, here is the chisel. So you, I take the four screws, I just, you don't have to really do that. I mean, for changing the oil, you don't have to do it all. Maybe after 10 years, 20 years, then you may need to, or if you really abuse the gearbox, you may have to do what I am doing. This is not for changing the oil. But I'm telling you how um, people understand. Okay, now, do you see that? It's empty right now. There's no oil here. Uh, so that this side shaft that rotates the, uh, the horizontal shaft rotates the vertical shaft. So the amount of oil you need, if I look at that, uh, let me show, take a screwdriver to show you. So if you look at that, there's, there's a, what this is called, I call tapper roller bearing. 
there's one more taper roller bearing like that at the bottom. So both the taper roller bearings really take all the stress and keep it aligned and take all the stress out of the system. So when you put the oil, the amount of oil you need only up this, at the top of this, top of this uh, the, the, the gear. You don't need really to the top. So when people overfill, that's where you will start getting the oil out. Uh, there are multiple oil, you know, like uh, ports for inserting the oil. Because this gearbox is designed for different kind of uh, mounting options. It can be, this is the uh, most commonly available thing, or it can be upside down, or it can be 90 degree this way, 90 degree that way. So they have a drain plug in all different areas. So mostly you will be using the drain plug only at the back to change the oil. I mean, we'll come to that I mean, later. But so the amount of oil you need is at the top of the gear, the, the uh, drain plug. So we have some early models and we replace one of the uh, uh, drain plug, what we call the drain plug. Uh, we replace the drain plug with a window. You can see how much oil uh, through the window. Okay, um, it's a drain plug. So if I measure, if I take an empty gearbox and thoroughly clean it, dry gearbox, and then if I want to add the right amount of the oil that's up to that, uh, uh, the drain plug, or maybe up to the top of the gear, that's close to 750 ml. That was, that's what you will see on the label. So you need a 750 ml of oil for effectively use that machine. You don't need more than that. Uh, the the gearbox has what we call as a, um, um, a breathing plug. Actually, to show you. Okay, the the breathing hole is always in this place. Don't don't change the breathing. Don't put a breathing hole anywhere else. I will explain to you the purpose of the breathing hole. The breathing hole is a plug that has a small hole. During the use, there's going to be expansion and shrink of uh, the, the volume of the uh, air inside. So just to make sure that the air inside, the, the pressure inside the, the, the gearbox is the same as the pressure outside the gearbox, they have a breathing hole to balance the air pressure. Okay? So uh, the, the, there are two different options for the breathing for the breathing hole. One is here with them. Depending upon how you orient, we have to put the, uh, the, the breathing hole in the right place. In this case, for our purposes, we put the breathing hole in the, in, in, in the, in the back. Because most of the time, uh, when you are draining the product, you bring the grinder down. When you bring the grinder down, you have to make sure that the breathing hole is on the top so that the oil doesn't come out. If you put the breathing hole in the wrong place, then what will happen, all the oil will start coming through the hole. We don't want that. So the breathing hole in, the, in this place, so when you tilt it, it doesn't, uh, the oil level always stays below the uh, breathing hole, so it doesn't ooze out. So as some people have kind of told us that, I mean, if they see the oil spill on the, uh, on the grinder, that's most likely that's because they have overfilled. So during the overfill, they filled it more than what they should. And that happens when you tilt it, the excess oil will try to come through the hole. So if you make sure that if you fill at the right level, you don't have to, you don't have the problem oil coming out. So that's why, that's the purpose of me showing you how the gearbox is. Of course, now we have a, a, the maintenance kit for the gearbox. For some reason, after so many years, if you know, you know, you, you, you really wore out the gearbox, then we can rebuild the gearbox. Uh, you know, we can ch change the gaskets uh, uh, to, 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 avoid any leak from the other places. So under normal use, it'll run for, I mean, no more than 10 years. You'll be running any problem. And so now you know why we add, uh, why you don't use excess oil and what the purpose of the breathing hole and uh, the drain plug and all that. In this case, you will not use any drain plug except for the one that's close to this motor. Okay, that's only for oil change. This is the only one that one next to the label. That's the only one that you will have access to that you need to do. You don't need to touch any of the other uh, plug. Okay? So for so the, one, uh, one second, then we want to show, tell them about the oil grade and the what kind of oil. Yeah, the oil that we recommend is a synthetic loop. Uh, it's the industrial grade, gear of gear loop. It's a 320 grade. Uh, it's very easily available, commonly available in most of the places. Just make sure you buy the synthetic grade so you don't have to. Uh, uh, change it very often. 
And they are asking, will the gear oil, if it leaks, will it get into chocolate? Yeah, well, this is going to be a very bottom of thing. There's no, no way, no possibility to get into the chocolate process. Because there's a downstream. downstream. And also, it's then close to capture in the uh, container. So, I mean, they cannot come into contact with the oil. Okay, now, <clears throat> now we are going to go into, I think, we, any, any questions about the gearbox? So, the, 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 the important thing is that the gearbox design is it, to take the actual load under normal use, so the gearbox doesn't take into any, uh, transfer any stress. No, you have to show them how to fill the gear oil. No. So now we are going to change, show you how you change the gear oil. Okay. Uh, uh, here, David and uh, uh, Gary are here to just to go through the oil change procedure. So uh, what we do is we take the front cover off in this grinder. So you can change the take the front cover and back cover off. I would say that may be the most time consuming. Make sure that I mean, there are electrical wires in the back and you loosen up the electrical wires so you don't drag them. Okay. Let me show you quickly. Oh, one, one second. Yeah. So, so you remove the back cover and loosen up the wires. Now you can see the back side of it. Now you will see, let me, when we, once we tilt it, we will see a lot more clear. So that's step number one, remove the front cover and back cover. So what you do, you have to tilt it. Typically you tilt it I mean, forward, right? You do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, so make sure you lock the swing arm. Now you can see the gearbox in the back installed. Uh, there is a, let me make sure that I go the other side of it. You can see that. Just to loosen that thing up. Yeah. I tilt I'm tilting it forward just to show you. Don't take it all the way, just loosen it. Okay. Now uh make sure I mean you give a you can open it with your finger. So don't you don't need more than that. Yeah. Yeah, right. And then you now you now you, what you need to do is you need to tilt it back. So tilting it forward just to make sure that you can, oh, you can even loosen it up without tilting forward. Go back. And then to, for tilting it backward for changing the oil, there is a tilt lock at the back. You remove that screw. So we, 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 typically, you know, you don't have to remove, remove this at all. It's permanently fixed. Only when you change your oil that you have to remove, that's why you put a screw, not the pin. The pin is when you need only when you do that more often. This is only maybe once in three years or once in two years or once in a year. Whenever you change oil, you remove that screw, pull it back, and then now put in the oil pan at the bottom. Now maybe maybe you can you can you can so make sure let I me mean, know it's it's a lot it's a lot so you can leave it I mean it, it can it will stand by itself now you can open the maybe you can open the arm and so you can fill it up I mean now uh, uh, Gary is going to just quickly show you <laughs> he is opening the. Let me show you, getting close.
Why is this coming from there? Maybe I will. Uh, one thing I want to remind is, before you change your oil, I strongly recommend you run the grinder for about 10 minutes to warm the gearbox so the oil can become less viscous and will drain completely out. So you don't, I mean, just leave it out. I mean, let it completely drain as much as we could. It will take about maybe 10 minutes to completely drain out. We are not going to wait for 10 minutes to have a complete drain. Uh, in, the, in the typical oil change, uh, that's what you will do. Uh, at this point, just to say, for the sake of time, I'm going to stop and assume that it's coming out. I'm going to put the plug back. You have to be careful not to cross thread the threads. That's it. Okay. So we drain the oil. At this point, what I would do, uh, I will find out how much oil I drain. Uh, you can buy. You can weigh the uh, pan before and after. You can find out the weight, and then you can convert that into volume. Uh, using the density, or you can transfer it into something like this, and then you can um, measure the volume of the oil that you collected, okay? This is a brand new machine that we, it's a brand new, it's new oil, uh, so we don't have to really throw the oil out. This is only for demonstration purpose. Now the oil is drained, completely drained. We are going to tilt it back. Now we are going to fill up the oil. That was back, right? So our coil is completely drained. And we'll open it. And to start with, I will add exactly the same amount of oil you took. As typically, you know, you don't lose the oil unless you really spill a lot of oil out. You don't lose the oil if it's right volume. So you can just add exactly the same amount of oil that you took. Uh, I mean, it may not be 750 ml because uh, even though you completely drain, there's a little bit of oil left. Then you take a funnel that has the small stem or maybe flexible funnel that has the small funnel, then you put it inside. And then using a funnel, you pour the oil back. In this case, we are going to pour the oil, same, same oil back because it's a brand new oil, uh, just to show you Yeah, just do the, we are not going to uh, add all oil back because we'll take care of it later. I just want to show you how you add the oil. Let's let's just let's assume that I mean that we have added the same I mean the same amount of oil that we took it out. Here it is. Okay. And then we are going to put the, I mean, before we put the plug, I would like to see how much oil is there inside. Okay. Uh, I would just based on our experience, if you, if you have a dipstick, if I measure the amount of oil inside, it should be approximately about 75 millimeters from the top. So you take a, some kind of plastic stick or straw or something, tie tag or something, you put it inside, don't force it, put it all the way in, and you lift it, then you will see the amount of oil. I mean, I mean in, in this case, I didn't, I didn't add all oil back, but, but if you look at that, the oil, take a look at it. If I added the right amount of oil, I should be reading about maybe 
75 yeah so 75 yeah so it should be it should, the oil the oil should be like at 75 so i, I should have the oil up to this level it's 75 80 in that level the final check is uh, this is only approximate just to give you an idea i mean whether we have a right amount of oil so let's say we give you this is step number one is what i call as a pre-filling so but after the pre-filling cap okay so after the pre-filling is done uh, if you do that a couple of times you know exactly what amount you need in the pre-filling and then you turn it back bring it vertical and then oh, one second. so after pre-filling i mean i will make the i will tilt it 90 degrees vertical and measure one more time using this port. You remember this port? This port that's next to the uh, 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 the breath breathing hole. So this is the oil check hole. Okay. How do you can take the breathing hole too? Either one of them, you can take it out. Yeah. Take ten. I'm going to take the breathing hole a breathing plug out just for I, don't, I hope you can see it maybe put some put, put some. take it out take the same dipstick Do the same thing. I mean, this is the this is the final confirmation thing. So you put that thing inside, and then you don't force it all the way. Just make sure it touches the bottom. When it touches the bottom, take it out. When you take it out, you should read 45 mm. That is final testing. So when you measure how much oil inside, like a dipstick, you should be you should see a oil for 45 mm. Then you know that that's right amount. 45 mm correspond to 750 mL. Okay. That's when you measure the different hole. Remember, I mean, no, it's 90 degrees when you tilt it. See, when, when you are measuring it through this hole. See, remember, I mean, this is where you put the oil in. See, this is where you put the oil. This is where you put the oil. And also, it's a tilted. So, you are measuring like this. Then, it's a 75 mm approximately. But that's only a prefill, like I said, I mean, not approximately. So the final testing should be this. When you put it inside, how much oil you have inside. So if you, if you, this much oil, that's a 45 mm. That is the final testing. So the, you don't just rely on that. This is only to give you an idea. Do you need to add more oil, less oil? Uh, so if you, have, if you have added the extra, extra oil, then you have to dine it out. If you need more oil, I mean, you can tilt it back and add a few more, you know, a little bit more oil to bring it back to the level. Okay. Okay. Uh, maybe, I mean, I will, next time I will take a measurement and tell you what exactly you should read here. Uh, you can use that measurement too. Okay. There are a couple of questions on this one. Yeah. And the <clears throat> oil drain plug, do you use the PTFE tape or you just put the regular? Uh, you, you don't really need a Teflon tape or the uh, drain plug. Uh, oil plug, yeah. But you can use it, doesn't hurt. You can use just only one layer of Teflon tape, it'll be fine. And when you tilt it, you know, um, they want to know the oil on the pressure gauge doesn't leak when you tilt the machine. No, there's, the oil on the pressure gauge is sealed. It doesn't leak. I mean, if we, if we use only about 3 ml of oil in the pressure gauge, uh, even if that something happens, then this, uh, spring sleeve will catch any oil that drips out of that. I mean, in, 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 in unusual situations, something like that happens, it doesn't come into contact with the foot. Even if, uh, if stream case, somebody might have mistake, something happened, uh, you have oil. That's a good deal oil we use. The other thing is, like, how if you add too much oil by mistake in the gearbox, how do you take out the extra oil? Just to drain, like, using a drain plug, drain it. Yeah. Just like, you know, when you change oil, you drain the oil, like that, you drain the oil. <laughs> 
tilting it backward. Next slide. Yeah, that's all the questions on the okay. IoT. Then uh, let's protect the other topic we're going to talk. Uh, one of the things is important in the, in the horizontal alignment. Uh, I'm going to keep the thing open to show you. Let me let me talk about the vertical alignment. In the grinding process, okay, there are two wipers, one in the back and one in the front. So the gap between the wiper and the drum should be as close to the, uh, the, the wiper should be as close to the drum as possible. Okay? If the gap is too much, then basically you are not really wiping the drum completely out and then all the stuff that stuck to the drum, it has a less chance of getting back into the mass. So for effect efficient grinding. So at the end of the grinding, you will see a lot of big particles, even though most of the grinding is done, uh, you will see a lot of big particles. Uh, so you will see uh, what if you do uh, the uh, analysis, particle size analysis, you will see a bimodal distribution. You have a group of big particles and a group of small, small particles. You want to have one single distribution with all the majority of them in the fine surveillance and in microns, 20 microns. So to make sure that the wiper is touching there all the time, you have to make sure that the drum rotates concentrically and with no wobbling. What do you do basically? There are, there are two different sides of wobbling. One is the drum, for some reason, it's not in the center of the gearbox. When that happens, it'll be moving around like that. When it's moving around like that, you cannot really bring the wiper close to the drum. Um, okay. So if it is moving too much in and out, the wiper cannot really come close. It has to be the gap will be too more than you knew would like to have uh, to keep, keep the wiper from scratching the drum. So obviously you are going to have a problem. So first you measure, you take a ruler and then you measure two things. One, what we call this uh, a lateral wobbling. You put that ruler here, okay, and measure the gap between the drum and the tip of the roller, ruler. It should be within that one day, I mean, within one millimeter. So you move it close, slowly move it close and see where it touches. Okay. You see the gap it changes? Really is less than a millimeter. So if it's not properly, particularly aligned, you will see the gap going up and down because the drum will be moving in and out, or maybe it's off center. Okay, that's one kind of uh, uh, that, that will have a major effect on the how efficiently you can wipe it. Okay, uh, and then second thing is you put that roller here and make sure that the bottom of the drum is slow up and down wobbling. So the drum is let's say the drum is should be exactly horizontal. If it is like this, then you will see that. The gap, the, when you put a ruler here, the gap between the top of the ruler and the bottom of the stone is going up and down. You will see, <coughs> you should not see that happening. You know, because when we manufacture them, we make sure that the, the drum is level and then the flange, the metal piece, that's level. So you should not see any of this vibration. I mean, if you see that kind of variation, call us that maybe something else sticking between the uh, metal support to the stone that we need to clean it up, but that's a little bit weird. I mean, you will not have that problem. So in the top, it should be whatever you see at the bottom. You should see something comparable at the top. Sometimes because that that might not be exactly one millimeter. That's that's less critical. But if you see any variation here, that's a less critical. Variation here is more critical. Okay. Automatically, when when you adjust, when you align this, it will be taken care of. Now we have seen. Customers, when they move the grinder to a different location, or when you don't have properly trained person, they happen to lose these nuts at the bottom that connecting the drum stone to the bottom of the gearbox. Then it's a metal plate. Uh, with the, I mean, let me. I'm going to show you a drum that's taken out from the grinder, and just for the purpose of uh, demonstration. 
This is just so you demo demonstrating the you know, how the drum is. Uh, when we when we ship it to you, when we ship you the grinder, uh, we will have we, we will have a black mark with a pen to draw it. So even if by mistake if it gets misaligned, can you can open this. Fifteen. I'm going to open this just to show you how the construction of this. So, This is how you will see a mark on the pen. <clears throat> so if you mark it so that by mistake, I mean, if uh, they happen to loosen this nut and then if this uh, the Delrin, I'm not Delrin, I mean, the, the, the cast iron plant, if it gets dislocated, uh, you can bring it back where it should be closed and then tighten it. That should happen. That means that that should help. But for some reason, if they don't, uh, if they over tighten this, this, this uh, uh, metal stud is anchored to the, uh, uh, the stone, uh, if you apply too much pressure, if somebody mishandled it, this may come loose, it may come out. In that point, what you need to do is, you need to get a screw that's the same size. This is a M10 uh, with, uh, what size is this, 65? Okay, 50, 50 mm long, uh, M8 screw, you can get a new screw or you can use the existing screw, you can put that thing back. So what happens to you, then we have a procedure in the video that you can, you can you can replace it uh, if it is damaged. Most, most, most of the time, you know, you won't need it. Uh, it may become loose. You just have to tighten it. Uh, since I want to really show you uh, how you do that when it's installed on the machine, uh, you don't have to really take the drum off. Just for the demonstration purpose, I'm going to show it outside how you uh, uh, tighten it. Or suppose, suppose uh, anchoring the, the if, if the if the uh, bolt that's anchored to the uh, drum, if it came off, how do you anchor it back? So when it comes out, then you will see a cavity there. So you clean the cavity. You want to explain to them, David? Sure. You want to explain to them? Um, okay. On, on replacing your, the bolt? Yeah, how do you? All right, as you put the bolt back in, you hold it in, in position and you have a glue this is an example of the glue that we use, or, or the tightener. It's kind anchoring, of, I mean, anchoring. Uh, it's anchoring an anchoring adhesive. Just make sure there's a two part anchoring glue uh, that, that have a tip that's specifically designed for mixing these two components. And when it comes out, when you squeeze it, the two components that come out, and when it comes out during when it, during the process of coming out, it gets mixed up. So when it heats here, it's completely mixed, ready to be cured. Okay, and as as you work it in, don't work it in too heavy around here. Don't get it on your stone if you can help. And when you let it dry, you let it, uh, it should self level. No, no, no. What, what, what you do is, uh, I mean, yeah, one thing. So when, once once you put the glue in. While the curing process, you want to make sure that's standing vertical. You don't want to be cured like this or like that. So you have something like this and leave it on the top. So this one rests on the granite. So that will keep this from tilting on the side. Okay, maybe take a bigger one. Bigger, bigger stage yeah. here. So let, let's say for example, I mean, uh, this is the one that came loose. No, you, you you clean the board first thoroughly, thoroughly with the acetone or maybe even a small wire brush, <coughs> maybe a sandpaper, you clean it thoroughly and you mix the glue with, like David was saying, I'm gonna put the glue inside and then a shorter one, biggest shorter. Is this one? <coughs> Get one of those uh, uh, sockets. Uh, I just want to make sure, I mean, this socket just not on the hole, outside the hole. 
So something like this is bigger than the uh, bigger than the hole. So you put the glue and then put the, the stud and then put that in the center and make sure that this will keep it from tilting on the side when the curing is going on. So leave it overnight. And then come in the morning, you will see that it's straight, vertically straight. So you will not have any problem. So that's how you anchor it back. Suppose for any reason, if, if you happen to uh, damage the anchoring system that comes with it, okay? So now we have shown you, just assume that, I mean, you don't have to do anything. Uh, you know, you, you, all, the, all the bolts are in place. So this is the flange, okay? So the point I'm trying to make is anytime you want to handle, handle the drum, and do not touch these four bolts. This is not for common in a regular use. You use this to release the drum. For some, and the only time I have seen people they have to use this one to remove the drum is they damage the threads. So for the, the, the this doesn't work anymore. There's only way you can take the drum off is losing that. Even then, if you put it back carefully, you don't have you, you don't have a big problem. So uh, the important point I want to stress here is when you put this screw the, the bolts back, I mean the nuts back, you have to use a torque wrench. Uh, the, the specified torque is this is a torque wrench, okay? The specified torque is approximately 15 foot pounds. That's all you need. And this is actually a, the, the 15 foot, 10 is the, mail, the limit where we'll be working in the very low end of the foot pound, foot pound. 15 foot pounds, that's all you need. So that may make sure you read the instructions on the torque wrench. We have this torque wrench, also we have a we have a, a digital torque wrench that you can set. I mean, I'll read the instructions again carefully. One of the torque wrench, you use it while you're tightening it, okay? So you visually look at it and make sure that, you know, the circle that you have drawn before, it's supplied with the, the grinder. I mean, it just matches. And then you put the washer. One, two, three, four. Whatever I'm doing here, you can do it outside, but most likely you will be doing that in the grinder itself. Because I mean, you may have to do the final adjustment. So we will be doing this, just a finger tight, all the four. So you will be doing that finger, finger okay? Now let's go back to this one. Alumna, I'll show you how you do that in the grinder itself. Zero. Okay. As you can see here, okay. these are the four bolts we are talking about. So you will be at this point, you will have only one installed in place. I'm going to show you under how much time we have. But David likes. No, no, that's okay. You cannot see what you're doing. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to purposely throw it out of alignment and align, align it again. Okay. Yeah, the one is no, no speed. Still within alignment, I'm going to purposely introduce a uh, uh, purpose move the drum. Don't show this. By mistake, let's say I'm going to. Okay, enough, yeah. The 
<laughs> still is not. Okay, see, see, this is the gap going up and down. So, which means our alignment. What you do, <clears throat> you find out a place. Let, let, let's, let's, let's see. Get the ruler. And find the location where the gap is the maximum. See, the gap is minimum here. So about 180 degrees, you will see the maximum. It is the maximum, right? Maximum. I make a, make a, make a mark. Okay, make a mark with a pen. And then... Tap it down. See, that's where the maximum I have made a mark in between this area. So what I need to do is <clears throat> move the drum about whatever I mean is about two two millimeter, right? And move the drum. I mean he's going to yeah, go ahead. Say the that. marks are here. Yeah, marks are here. So move it, bring it, and then using a two by four. Using a wooden piece. So what you do, uh, that's what the uni in, in, in this needs to go into the center. So that's one sticking out. So the way to bring that back is have a two by four or similar wooden piece and slowly push it in the opposite direction to reduce the gap. So you do it two times. Then you make sure that you bring it back to the center. So this is where we thought we, thought we found out this maximum gap. So I will use some kind of two by four and then slowly push it down. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So where, whatever that, I mean, be that, that sticking, that was, the gap was too much. You measure it from the other side and you're pushing it from the side, right? Okay. Yeah, actually, actually, uh, yeah. Please, maybe, maybe. No, 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 that's fine. Just bring it back where it was. So that, see, that's where the maximum gap was, right? I mean, you're right. I mean, on the right? This is where you saw the maximum gap, right? So you have to bring it back so that the gap is minimum. See, I think it'd be, I get added too much. If I go back and do it, I mean, you can see that a bit too much. I think I, I really did it too much. But you see, wherever it was a more gap, now I see the less gap. I moved in the opposite direction, right? So the approximately, I would say the gap is uh, five, six, maybe eight mm. So I have to move it back by four, four, eight, eight, four mm to bring it back in the center. Okay. So whatever the point that was, the gap is, I pushed it too much. Now I have to push this way four millimeter. Actually, you can measure the gap here using your ruler, and you can move exactly the way you want. Right now, it's about uh, 18, maybe 17 millimeters. I mean, I'm going the right direction. Right now, the gap went almost to half. So, about two millimeters more. So, the gap is 15 millimeters. So, you, you basically, you find out how much you have to move and then So 
So you do it few times and make sure that at the center, once you center it, make sure that turn it around. Let me know like our baby started. Do it at really slow speed and measure it and make sure that in the center. On the second time, let's assume that I have alumina aligned it so that it's you know, touching the spirit by putting the now. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to tighten it. The critical thing that again I said is you know, put the first nut, the critical thing, and during the process, don't touch the drum. And now everything is tight, finger tight, all the four are finger tight. Now use a torque wrench. Torque wrench. What size is this pack? 12, 13, 15, 15. It's all set up. It's set up. So now we have attached the 13 mm thing. 15. The, no, I'm sorry. 15 mm. 15 mm. Yeah, 15 mm. So you set the torque for the right one. We have set it for actually. Ten, 15 foot pound. Just read the instructions before use and then Use the start wrench until you hear that. When you say the click sound, then you know that you have played right start. So you go back, go to the next one. I don't know if you can hear the click sound in the system, but uh, you do, do it uh, opposite. Come on, come on, lady. Okay, I get, I get the click. So it's a 15. So you go back and do the same thing in all the all the four. Okay. Last one. So I have now tightened all the okay, 15, so 15 foot pound. Uh, okay, now the trick is how do you do it with this? You put one more neck to make sure that it doesn't come loose. So when you're doing this, you don't, you want to hold the top one and then do this one more. Here it is. So you hold the top one with one wrench, okay? So it doesn't move. And then use the second one to tighten it. So make sure that you don't do anything that I hold it, tighten the bottom one, that's it. You do that in all the four. Then you have tightened up all of them to the right tension, I mean, right torque. Uh, keeping the drum in the vertical, no, no wobbling. And that that text has a wobbling thing. Any questions on that? Okay. Okay. Uh, in the early days, when we ship and we used to ship it with the rubber band, uh, you may have to once in a while you may have to adjust the tension on that. Really, uh, unless you uh, uh, the system gets over hard because the pan is not working for whatever reason. If it gets hot, you may dead, you may dead. Belt may damage, or maybe just wear and tear. Uh, you are changing the belt. Basically, you know, you work on this on four nuts. So you one, two, three, four. You loosen this top two, and then you loosen the bottom one, and then bring it down, 
uniformly and then that will increase the tension. You measure the tension up with your hand or maybe if you have a tension device, you can measure the tension, whatever recommended for the belt. And then you tighten that. Okay, you, well, when the tightening thing, you will, this, you will, you, you will <coughs> tighten the top one first, right tension, and then you lock this thing with the bottom one. So when you loosen it up, you loosen this first one, uh, this, these two bolts first, and then you work on the bottom ones. And the reverse, when you when you have right tension, work on the top ones and bring it, bring the plate down until you get the right tension, and then you lock the bottom one. Uh, <clears throat> with the with the new ones, in the, in the last few years we have been shipping with the link belt. It's a, it's a fiber belt. Uh, really, people who have used this machine, they, you, you have been using this. They didn't have any chance to. They didn't have any chance to. Uh, they didn't have any need to change the belt at all. I see the adjust the Yeah, we, the, the, the once you set the adjust, maybe in the very beginning, you may have to uh, adjust it a little bit, even then you don't have to do it if you do it in the factory. Uh, once you set the belt, it'll run for a long time, I mean, before you need any replacement. That's it we want to cover. Are you done? Let me ask if they were. Uh, hi, all. I hope uh, you are all enjoying, uh, you know, watching this. And if you have any questions, please let us know. We have another 15 minutes. So if you want to know anything else, we will be glad to do it. Let me see if any questions. <clears throat> So if um, okay, um, somebody had a pressure gauge, they had a leak, yeah. so they want to know if he took it off and uh, replaced with the new one or drain out the oil for the tension. I know tension Where gauge. You know, this is a, you know brand, a, three months ago. Darren, Dr. Darren. Oh, okay. Uh, <coughs> okay. Yeah, so we will uh, send the assembly instructions uh, for installing the new pressure gauge. Okay, and then uh, somebody is asking, does a grinding machine do the tempering also? No, it doesn't do the tempering. Tempering is a completely different process. So you have to do hand tempering or there is a special tempering machines batch tempering or continuous tempering machines because there you are changing the temperature of the uh, you know, chocolate liquor to develop the right crystals so ours does only grinding and conching not tempering and anyone else have any other question okay Oh, okay. Um, stone lifting mechanism. Can you show? <laughs> so you have to switch up the switch up the grinder. Show the first, first installing it on the grinder. Yes. Yeah, just okay. show it. from the beginning. Yeah. It is removable. No, take, take it completely take it out. Completely out. <clears throat> and then put it back on. It slides right in. Okay. Well, I'll, David, Get can back. you show correctly? Because people could not see it. So a little oh, bit slow. Yeah. Gary, can you? Completely out. Yeah. yeah. 
So you need only one stone lifting mechanism, even though you might have multiple machines. So this is very easy to move from one to another. Okay. Put it like that. Okay. okay. All right. And then bring it up. Watching your ceiling. Right, right hand over the base. Let's do it from the side. Yeah, so it just mounts on the, the A-frame of the right. unit. This mechanism right here. Come just a little bit closer. All right. This sleeves right over your stone assembly in the hole. We'll slide straight in. No need to tighten it with a wrench. You can hand tighten it, and that's sufficient. Forward. Okay. Want to tighten it on the lift and guide it. What we're doing, we turn it. When your stone is clear and your wipers are clear, you can turn the whole unit over to a table or to the floor, wherever you'd like to set it. Keep on setting it back in. When you do set it, make sure you lock your pin here. If you're just going to leave it hanging for just a minute, you can lock the pin and it will lock the unit and keep it from sliding on you. Loosen it, bring it back in, and slowly guide it back in place. Set it right in the center. Gently. Reverse your process. Throw your pin. And you've completed your process of removing and replacement. Simply slide it out of the way or remove it. And set it out of the way while you're making your chocolate, however you choose to do it. Any questions? One, One second. Yeah, um, there is no more question on that. Yeah, that yeah, already tells us in <clears throat> So you want to show the um, main uh, the nip feeder? So the the, the lift area is very easy to install. So it's a it's a same thing that we use for the uh, uh, binover for feeding the uh, broken uh, beans. So you connect it. So you fill the uh, hopper with we have hopper extension for this. You fill up the hopper with the nibs, and then you uh, it's it's it position you position the uh, uh, nib feeder I mean, nib feeder in such a way that. Uh, it falls right in the place where the chocolate is moving fast, no stationary part. So you can move it 
slightly amenoid is in and out, I mean, to the center or away from the center, you position it. So you make sure that I mean, when it drops down, look at it and make sure that it gets mixed up with the chocolate immediately. Now you, know, you adjust the feed, I mean, how fast you want to add by controlling the speed. Okay, so looks like uh, we don't have any other questions. So we thank you all for spending time with us and learning about it and giving us an, a chance to talk to you about our machines. If you have any questions, you can always uh, reach, uh, reach us by Skype, which is cocotown.com, or email, um, phone call. You are welcome to contact us. And we just we make sure that uh, you, you are all staying safe and healthy. Thank you. Loka Samasta Sukhino Bhavantu. Bye.